heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan. This is episode 293, covering the week of January 17th through January 21st, 2022. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, like our Gab page, and subscribe to our YouTube page. The YouTube page is invaluable. You've got not only the podcast, but you've got all of our lectures that we've recorded over the years. Now, that doesn't include everything we've done, but we have a number of lectures there free of charge on a variety of topics. It is a great resource for you to continue your education about the Southern tradition. And we've got great scholars that present there. And a lot of people don't like it on the left and even the neoconservatives. They let us know in the comments. So it's quite funny at times. But anyways, get that, get on that YouTube page, subscribe to that. Also subscribe to this podcast, rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Let people know you like this podcast and it can shoot it up the charts so we can get more people interested in the Southern tradition that way. If you do like what we do, consider a tax-deductible donation to the Institute. You can click on that Donate button at abbevilleinstitute.org. That's A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E, institute.org. Click on the Donate button. It'll take you out to the page to donate. You can donate monthly, annually, or a one-time gift. We do appreciate all of your support. We only exist by your generous contributions. So that's a great reason to go ahead and donate. Also, make us your preferred Amazon Smile charity. So if you shop at Amazon, you can uh, go to Amazon Smile. You can make Abbeville Institute your preferred charity, and we do get a little bit of dough out of that when you buy a book or you buy some household goods. Whatever you're buying at Amazon, we get a cut. It's not a lot, but we do get a cut out of that, and we do make a little bit of money on that every year, since some of you have done this. Also, download our free mobile application. Again, at abbevilleinstitute.org, you can see at the top of the page, get our mobile app. Click on that, free of charge you get our mobile app. So you can get it on your device. Just go to your uh, Apple store or uh, your uh, Google store and download the app. That way you've got Abbeville Institute on the go. Also, click on that shop tab at abbevilleinstitute.org. You can get our logo and all kinds of cool stuff. It's embroidered, so it's going to last a long time. It's not screen printed. It's embroidered, which means it's better quality. Also, give us that email address at abbevilleinstitute.org and we'll send you a free ebook. Exploring the Southern Tradition. You'll get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday. This is how we keep in touch with you. This is how we let you know about forthcoming conferences, forthcoming events, or, of course, our material we're publishing every day at the Institute. If you're not getting those emails, make sure that you check your spam folder. Make sure you whitelist the Institute. That does come in sometimes, come into play. So make sure you're doing that. And by the way, Zoom conferences, we have one coming up January 27th. We still have a lot of tickets left. We've actually bumped the number of tickets we can sell to these. Um, so there's, we're never going to run out. So make sure you're getting over there and getting on to these Zoom webinars. They're fantastic. This one's going to be on the 14th Amendment. It's with uh, Professor Jesse Merriam, who is a law professor uh, at, at uh, Patrick Henry University. And he's written a lot about the 14th Amendment. He's really good, solid scholar on the issue. And so he's going to talk about the origins of the 14th. He's going to talk about where it went wrong He's going, to do, he's going to discuss some things about how the 14th Amendment really did create an entirely new constitution. So that's something I think a lot of people are interested in. And then the question is going to be, well, how do we, how do we change that? I think some people are, are interested in that subject. Well, what could be done about this if this is the case? The 14th Amendment really did change America, it revolutionized America, created a second founding, as Eric Foner has called it. Well, well how do you do something about that? And Jesse Merriam actually has... Some an interesting solution to that. And it's something we've talked about on this uh, podcast and on the website before, but um, it's something that you need to hear. So get on that Zoom webinar. If you're on the email list, you're, you've are you gotten an email about it. So make sure you enroll in those. They're only 10 bucks, right? Only $10 to do these things. And uh, I mean, it's, it's well worth your time. It's an hour of your time on Thursday, the 27th. So get on over there and join us for that. You can ask questions. So it's a great opportunity. I will be on the, the webinar. I'm on every webinar along with our presenters. So if you want to ask me a question, you can do that too uh, as well at these webinars. So uh, that's a fantastic opportunity for you. All right. Well, let's talk about the topic of the week. There's a couple of big, of course, issues this week. 
January 17th through January 21st is Lee Jackson Week, and the South, of course, across the United States is Martin Luther King Week. So we've got both of those things working this week. We didn't run any pieces on, on Stonewall Jackson this week, but we did talk about Robert E. Lee. At least we ran a book review uh, on Wednesday, which is Lee's birthday, January 19th, on Lee. We also ran a piece on Martin Luther King on Monday by Boyd Cathy. So I want to talk about both these things. In fact, somebody asked me on my own podcast, on the comments on a YouTube video, if you don't get that, it's the Brian McClanahan Show. Go on out and subscribe to that one, too. I do that Monday through Thursday. So uh, if you want this more than once a week, you can get the Brian McClanahan Show, and I talk about all kinds of other things, too. But uh, somebody asked me what I thought of Boyd Cathy's piece. Well, of course, you're going to get that if you get the Abbeville Institute podcast. So I'm going to talk about it. And I, I want to talk about Martin Luther King in this particular way. First of all, we have to understand, and this is something that's been pointed out before, Martin Luther King was the greatest opportunist of the 1950s and 60s. And when I say by opportunist, Rosa Parks was more courageous in many ways than Martin Luther King. Rosa Parks was actually doing something that was, uh, at the time, uh, unprecedented in the city of Montgomery. And there's a picture of Rosa Parks at the Montgomery bus boycott. And who's in the background? Well, Martin Luther King. Why? Because they capitalized on something that Rosa Parks did. So Martin Luther King was the original Jesse Jackson, the original Al Sharpton. He's he's a hustler. This is what he's doing. And the unfortunate thing about King is a lot of people now try to equate him as a conservative. They try to make King out to be a conservative. He would have been a conservative today. There's nothing further from the truth. King was pushing much of the same things that are happening on the left, the woke left today, in the 1960s. And I think this is the, the tragedy with modern American society. We don't fully understand these people, and because of a myth, which we talk about myths all the time, the myth of the kindly General Lee, the myth of Robert E. Lee, the lost cause myth. Well, the only myths that are suitable to tear down are those that support traditional American society or the South. All other myths are okay. They're on the table. They're okay to perpetuate. The myth of Martin Luther King is just that. The man had poor ethics, poor morals, he was a communist. I mean, there's no, there's little doubt about it. And you can say, well, he just dabbled with that. He didn't, didn't really get involved. The man was, was moving in that direction. He favored racial quotas. He would have been in favor of wokeism today. There's no doubt about it. Martin Luther King would have been right in lockstep with what's going on today uh, if he was still alive. Now, we can talk about how King was assassinated. That's a whole other thing. And, of course, I do believe the government... Uh, and this is just my personal opinion. There's there's too much uh, evidence that there, this was not a lone individual doing this. That the the federal government was involved somehow in that particular event. Uh, but that's beside the point. Um, King for years was an image. He's a myth. He's a charlatan. In fact, his name's not really even Mike, uh, Martin Luther King. It's Michael King. He never officially changed his name to Martin Luther King. He's Michael King. And that's one of the main things, right? So if we're going to tear down a statue of Robert E. Lee or Stonewall Jackson or George Washington or anybody because there's a myth, well, then the myth of Martin Luther King needs to be exposed. And I think this is interesting. A lot of the left, I mean, they'll, they'll celebrate King, but this is why we had to have another federal holiday, Juneteenth. It's why that they've, in some ways, they know this, this, this baggage is out there for King. So they've moved away from King in some ways. They still have the monument to King in D.C. Uh, but they've moved away from King in some ways. Now, if you watch you know, mainstream television, uh, you watch any of that, you're going to see celebrations of King all over the place. You're going to have your Martin Luther King Jr. parade days and things like that. But uh, the fact is, the left realizes there's a lot going on here. And it's not just conservatives who are talking about this. It's people on the left. You see, once all the FBI tapes were exposed with King, and this is what Boyd Cathy gets into his piece on Monday, once all that came out, there's a whole other picture of King, of King the, uh, the, the woman abuser, right? I mean, this is, this is now uh, out there. King was by no means someone who Me Too could get behind. This is a man that did horrible things to women, 
Uh, he cheated on his wife all the time. This is not somebody who we respect morally. And it, you, of course, you have the image of King riding, walking with his wife, playing ball with his kids, riding his bike. Look at this wholesome individual just riding around. He's just a good guy. Just a good man. Uh, but yet the evidence points in an entirely different direction. And not just that. When you look at uh, Lee, for example, let's compare Lee to King in that way. Uh, the the book Reading the Man by Pryor tried to point portray uh, Lee as someone with very odd fetishes, someone who was uh, just not very morally acceptable. But there's nothing that compares Lee to King in terms of their morals and how they conducted their life. Nothing. Uh, King was it could not even hold a candle to Robert E. Lee's morals. So. This is the important thing about King. If you just want to talk about a moral individual, someone that would fit with you know, the, the Me Too society, Robert E. Lee would be more in line with that than Martin Luther King. And in fact, all Southern gentlemen would. This is the whole point, I think, that's really interesting about Me Too. Me Too, in some ways, is asking for men to act like Southern gentlemen. They don't want to be you know, Harvey Weinstein or Bill Clinton or Jeffrey Epstein or any of these people. They want men to be the, the typical Southern gentleman. Now, we know not everyone in the South behaved that way. Even in the, gent even the upper class, they didn't behave that way. We know there's, there's examples where they didn't. You know, James Henry Hammond comes to mind. They just didn't behave appropriately. We know this. But we know there were a lot of men who did behave appropriately. And there was this image of the Southern gentleman, the man that had to think about how he acted. There's George Washington, for example. Um, there's Robert E. Lee. Now, it didn't mean these men didn't flirt. Of course they did. George Washington did all the time. Robert E. Lee did all the time. But they never cheated on their wives, and they never did anything that would have been considered outside of bounds like Harvey Weinstein did or any of these other individuals, Epstein, Clinton, uh, Martin Luther King. They never did any of that stuff. So the fact is, we ha what, what women really want is that. They want that Southern gentleman. And that's the if, if men still acted the way they did in the South, then we wouldn't have so much of this, uh, you know, these problems in modern society with male-female relationships and how uh, you know women are treated. Now, again, we know that uh, not everyone followed this ideal. Uh, we also know that if women acted the way they did in the antebellum South, uh, there wouldn't be some issues as well. So th the antebellum South has much to teach us about ethics and manners and morality. And I think that's important. You know, this is something that we don't hammer enough, uh, that those things are very important. Of course, it was all based on a Christian understanding of society and male-female relationships. There was, there was all of that to it. Tradition. Tradition mattered. You don't just tear it down because when you do, when you take down all the fences, you create all the problems. So that's one thing that I think that, that Boyd does a good job exposing was King's immorality and how uh, how can how can the left champion such a man when we know the evidence is there? Perpe I mean, again, pointed out by the left that this guy was a pretty despicable person behind the scenes. The other thing, of course, is that King always cheated and lied. We know that his "I Have a Dream" speech was plagiarized. We know that his dissertation was plagiarized. The left knows this; they know it one hundred percent. They know it, but. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if someone cheats. It doesn't matter if someone lies, as long as they're saying the right things. Look, Joe Biden was pegged in the 1980s for being a plagiarizer. He, he, he's a liar. Joe Biden has always been a liar. Joe Biden's always been a charlatan. He's always been a, a, a politician. And this is exactly what Martin Luther King was. He was a charlatan, a politician, a liar, and he was image. Image over substance. And I think that's the thing that we have to understand with Martin Luther King. Whereas... Robert E. Lee was substance over image. He always was. He didn't like the image. After the war's over, the man virtually retired from public life. He didn't want to even be involved in it. He took the little job at Washington College because it got him away. He didn't want the spotlight. He didn't want to be in that. And I think that's, again, a stark contrast between King and Lee and why neither, I mean, King doesn't hold a candle to Lee in terms of character and manhood. Not even close. There's not even any question. So this piece by Boyd Cathy is, in very short order, destroys the myth around Martin Luther King, Michael King,
destroys the image around King, the unjustifiable, you know, sainthood around King. Now we can what society has done this though is they said, okay, well, look, well, King was fighting for the right thing, and he was the conspicuous face of all of this, so he deserves the monuments and everything else. But we know, as Kathy pointed out, there were people opposed to this. Ronald Reagan caved on it. And the people that were behind it were neoconservatives like Newt Gingrich and others. I mean, these are the people pushing this stuff, right? The neoconservatives were pushing this stuff because why? They wanted to make King into their conservative hero. If they could do that, if they could take King out of the left and put him in the right, well, then see, we're all just these. I mean, this is this is the 1776 commission report that came out of the Trump administration. This is what it's all about. All those people are now conservatives. Frederick Douglass, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Martin Luther King. They were not conservatives at all in any way. They were not interested in the Southern tradition. They were not interested in traditional America in any way. And I think that's the important thing to get out of all, it, all of it. King cannot be those things. And to lionize King is to essentially lionize the modern woke left. You, you have to. And so if anybody does it, uh, and and uh, on in any uh, across any part of the political spectrum, they're playing into the hands of the modern woke left, and I think that's important to, to get out of this. Now you can say things that well, I mean we we don't clearly we don't support segregation, we don't support slavery, uh, and King and, and these things, these changes that were being made were changes that needed to be made. You can say those things, but King as the man is the problem, not necessarily the. Uh, what happened with uh, ending segregation or or some of these other things that happened in the South, some of the changes that were made, which I think most Americans support, right? I mean, there's there's no one out there that I, uh, that I know of who doesn't support these changes. But to lionize King is problematic, to say the least, when you're taking down statues of men who were far better in terms of character than Martin Luther King. All right, so that's that's where Boyd Cathy's piece, I think, does a good job. And look, I know there are people out there that like Martin Luther King, and, and they like him because of the ending segregation, the civil rights movement, and these things. And I understand all of that. I, I get it. And I, I don't think there's, for first of all, again, as I just said, there's nothing wrong with that. But lionizing King, putting a statue up to King and saying, here's this man that's beyond reproach, but yet we're going to take down Lee because he held views that are not in line with 21st century America. So did King. So if we're going to do that, let's just take down all monuments. Everything has to come down. We can't lionize anybody unless they are, you know, someone that's in line with exactly what we're thinking at this particular moment today. And then 10 years from now, we're going to have to take that statue down too. You see, this is the problem with all of this. This is the problem with the statue, the, the, the statue grabbers, and and uh, it, it's, it never ends. And society is moving in a direction that will never end. The revolution will consume itself. We've seen this over and over again. History proves it. And that's the danger in all of this. Today's leftist is going to be tomorrow's conservative, according to the left, and they're going to be demonized, and your positions are going to be seen as antithetical of the modern left. Okay. That said, we also ran a couple of interesting pieces uh, that go along with this, correspond with that. Richard Russell, for example. We had a piece this week, 2020 Moral Hindsight. It's by Charles Goolsby, and uh, this was actually published in, in um, 19... Let's see, when was it published? 1992, I believe. Uh, it was published in Southern Partisan Magazine in 1992. And it's a review of Richard B. Russell Jr., Senator from Georgia by Gilbert C. Fight. And again, written by Charles Goolsby. Um, Richard Russell is was one of the most important political figures in American history. He's from Georgia. The man dominated the Senate. In fact, he dominated Washington, D.C. in so many ways. Lyndon Johnson learned at the step of Richard Russell. And if Richard Russell was not from Georgia, he would have been president. I think there's no question about it. Richard Russell would have been president of the United States. Uh, but because he was from Georgia, and because he had the baggage of the civil rights movement ta attached to him, and again, this is all works together with King, there was no way Americans were going to support him. And unfortunately, what, what Goolsby uh, points out in this is that uh, Fight should know better than writing the biography that he does because he essentially attached all of the things that basically became a story of uh, white supremacy. And 
This is what uh, this is what Goolsby said. Fight should have titled the book Richard B. Russell Jr. Champion of White Supremacy, because that's the only thing that Fight points out. And he says that th- Fight should have known better. He wrote some good histories, but you got to understand the times. 1991, we're getting in a point now. The, the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, we're starting to see this. Uh, myth-making of Martin Luther King heat up. Now, we've had a federal holiday for King for a little while then. We're starting to see it heat up. And we're starting to see a reevaluation, a revision of the 1950s and 60s. And Russell did not fit the, uh, the image that the Academy wanted to portray, that the mainstream political class wanted to portray. Richard Russell couldn't do it. And Goolsby points out, he says, look, this is a guy that would have been accepted by the by the left all the time. He says, though he gives Senator Russell full credit for school lunches, agricultural price supports and subsidies, a strong national defense, and other projects dear to diehards of New Deal Democrats, the author's overall tone is hostile and accusatory. So then Goolsby says, one is given to wondering just how many America's great men could meet professors' fight test of true national leadership. He says, certainly not Lincoln, Jefferson, Madison, Washington. None of them could. See, this is the problem. And and what the Academy has done, Gilbert Fight, 1991, and what you're starting to see is they're giving the left ammunition to take all this stuff down. He's exactly right. Look, Lincoln's going to have to come down eventually. The man was not in line. His racial views were not in line with modern society. Jefferson, Madison, Washington, of course, they're coming down. But you're going to see a reevaluation of all of these people. The South has always been the low-hanging fruit. The South has always been the low-hanging fruit. And what we're getting here is 2020 moral hindsight. It's what Goolsby titled this piece. We're looking back on this and saying, well, uh, these people just don't fit with our modern views. But what they don't realize is that the books that Russell was reading, as Goolsby pointed out, were the mainstream books in the 1920s. And these are books on uh, race that we would consider to be just obsolete today in, in modern society. But this is what Russell was reading. And so we're holding him to a standard that he would not have known. You cannot do that. It's presentism in its worst form. And so, uh, one thing that Goolsby said I found interesting, he said this, that this attitude persisted among blacks well after World War II, is well established by no less an authority than the late Dr. Ralph D. Abernathy, trusted lieutenant of Dr. Martin Luther King. In his colorful autobiography, And the Walls Came Tumbling Down, Dr. Abernathy recalls how his own perception of race relations changed only after his military service abroad and the completion of a college education. And what he's saying there in the preceding paragraph is that blacks and whites in the South had essentially the same views on race relations. It's only after Abernathy was nationalized, and then it's only after Abernathy spent time overseas, and only after he went to university that he started changing his attitude on race. So if he hadn't been nationalized, things would have been different. And, and I, there's a quote that was circulating around from King, and this is, this is one thing that uh, people miss with King. He wasn't content with just solving things in the South. In fact, he pointed this out all the time. We got to take this. I mean, this, if, there's, if there's discrimination in one corner of the United States, we have to fight with all of our, with all of our muscle to get rid of this one ev- ev- one essence of discrimination. So what he wanted was nationalization of everything, right? So the ultimate benefactor of King is the federal government, the general government. This is why they love this stuff, because it gives them more power. It's always about power. It's never about anything else. 1861 to 65 was about power. It was about the Union controlling the southern states. It was about power. It's always about power. All the other things were incidental to that. They were byproducts of the quest for power, and that power to be wielded however the ruling class wants it to be used because they're in control and they get to tell everybody else what to do. The academy is the same way. 
You've got professors that really enjoy the amount of power they have over people and what they get to do to people and how they get con to control their future, so to speak. I mean, I saw somebody tweet about this the other day. I pace around when I have to write somebody a, a letter of recommendation because I realize the power that I have to change this person's life. It's power. Now, that can be used for a positive, of course. You can encourage people. You can support people. You can do these things. But you can also destroy people. And I think that's important to note with all this as well. So it's about power. Now, on to Lee. I've talked a lot about King and, and Russell. On to Lee and a couple other things. Lee, we've talked about Lee so much on this show. I don't know um, if uh, we need to cover more things with Lee. But the the piece that we ran on Wednesday, again, it's a, it's a review from... Uh, back in the 90s, 1992 issue of Southern Partisan. It's a review of General Robert E. Lee and Civil War History by Alan T. Nolan. And uh, the Nolan book was one of these first books in the 90s to really try to take down Robert E. Lee. <clears throat> and I remember I was an undergraduate, uh, and I was in a history class. My professor assigned people to go read books, um, you know, do a book review and present that. And one of the individuals pick this book. And I still remember that because uh, this professor was not in line with, with Nolan's book, and he really ripped this person down when they when they reviewed this book because they supported it. it was, this is great. Um, what This is uh, David Bovenizer from 1991. Bovenizer used to be one of the editors at uh, Regnery Publishing. And um, Bovenizer rips apart Nolan again for presentism. He rips him apart for presentism. This is what we're getting to. Lee was being torn down as early as the 90s for being a person that Americans couldn't support. And th the reason we want to publish this is because the stuff that's going on with Lee now is not new. It's been going on for 30 years now, but it's just finally taken that much time for the left to gain as, as much power as they can and to have enough dopes out there who believe this stuff that they'll put pressure, political pressure, to take things down. And now, if you say Lee was a great man, you're a revisionist. But see, all of this is really the revision. I saw this the other day. Somebody called me a revisionist because I was uh, defending Robert E. Lee. I'm a revisionist now. No, Nolan is a revisionist. Pryor is a revisionist. All of the dopes on the left who are taking down Lee, they're all the revisionists. They're the revisionists. Not, not me. I'm telling you, uh, this is what Americans believed about Lee for nearly a hundred years, right? Lee was a great American. So that's the, the, uh, the important thing to get about this. And I like this review. It's very good uh, because he just completely takes apart uh, Nolan. He says at the end, in the last analysis that Nolan has given us, not a consideration of Lee, but an exposition of his own vaunted attempt intellectually to grasp the whole complex of a historical phenomenon by viewing it through the lens of the ideology of progress and focused on the single and also complex matter of slavery and race. It is engaging, but ultimately a failed and even frustrating attempt, and we better titled Nolan Considered by Robert E. Lee. Right? So this is a reflection of who Nolan is, and I think that's important. Bovenizer gets that exactly right. When the leftists say things like, well, these people aren't using primary documents. They don't know about the primary documents. They're actually pro projecting their own failures because they know that what they're doing is cherry picking. They know that what they're doing is not the entire story. They know that what they're doing is using present values to take down historical figures. They know all this stuff. They know it's all about them. And you have to know who the people are writing the history to know these things. right? They know it's all about them at the end of the day. It's not really about the historical figures. It's about pushing their position for power, by the way. And if they take down these people, that gives them more power. They have power over the way you think. It's about them. So this is a really good piece. And then uh, Thursday, of course, we had a little piece. Um, if you saw this in the news where the general government is uh, organizing military exercises in North Carolina, a place they call Pineland. And it's uh, for... Um, 
the the idea is to uh, uh, pr- plan for a domestic insurrection, right? We know all this is coming from. It's coming from the uh, where the Democrats are today and the left is today with uh, anybody that doesn't agree with them. Well, they become enemies of the state, so to speak. And so uh, they're trying to show force, right? So this is exactly what this is doing. Now, it doesn't mean they haven't done this stuff before. Of course they have. But it's really conspicuous now. And Jason Morgan does a good job pointing out how this is really the Yankification of America. It's what's happening. It's, it's all a result of the Yankee Empire. And th- to put this in the South, I mean, the, the message is entirely clear. They could have done this anywhere else in the United States. They could have done it in Minnesota. They could have done it in California. They could have done it anywhere else. They could have put this military exercise somewhere else, but no, they did it in the South, and they did it in the South because that's where it makes the most sense. They're showing that this is what force they have, and don't mess with the United States. Now, of course, this is of the belief that there's you know, millions of people running around out there ready to take down the United States. Nothing's further from the truth. Nothing is further from the truth. But this, in their own imagination, this is what's happening. You see, that's the issue. Their own imagination is running wild. This has always been the Yankee problem. Whatever exists between their two ears is reality. It doesn't matter if reality smacks them in the face and says, no, that's not true. This is reality. It doesn't matter. The world exists between their between their ears and their little minds of mush. That's what the world is. And they're going to prepare for it. It's just like there was an image of, you know, stacked up uh, riot shields there in the Capitol for weeks after this is over. It's all cosplay. It's all theater. It's all theater. It's there to show that, oh my gosh, we have to have these things because we got all these people running around going to take us down. It's not true at all. It's not true at all. So um, this is what I find fascinating about this. And then, of course, we had another installment of Clyde Wilson series in Southern Poets and Poems, uh, Louisa, uh, Susanna uh, Chev's McCord. Louisa McCord is who it is, but um, Louisa McCord is fantastic. Um, If you've never read any of of her material, very highly educated. In fact, I would put Louisa McCord up against just about any other northern writer or thinker of the time. I would also put Augusta Jane Evans in that same category in terms of really intelligent women, but I thought women couldn't be educated in the South. I thought the South was all backwards and women weren't there. Women weren't respected, blah, blah. I mean, this is what you get out of this, but it's simply not true. In fact, McCord was translating Bastier. So, I mean, here's a person uh, that understood free market economics. Uh, I mean, for example, Calhoun's most trusted confidant was his daughter. His letters to his daughter were fantastic in terms of the things he would say. He he encouraged her her education and believed that she was on an equal level with any man. There's no doubt about it. So, uh, I mean, th- you find this all across the South. We have a characterization of the South as simply not true because of gender roles, traditional gender roles and traditional society. So we think that all the women were just backwards. They didn't know anything. Well, it's not true at all. And that we had all these educated women in the North and they knew all these things and these Southerners are just backwards. It's not true at all. Not true at all. All right. So we had a lot of good stuff this week at the Institute. Went a little long, but we had a lot to talk about. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. Until next time. Good day.